But, so, uh, welcome from my side and a happy new year, of course. I'm uh, very glad to welcome you to the first DCARB-CH lunch lecture in the new year. Where they, the subject today is a bubble in the lake, big thermal energy storage underwater, question mark. And that fits, of course, perfectly to DCARB-CH, to, to our project, which aims at, at uh, thermal energy. And we know that thermal energy storage would be extremely valuable, but we don't know exactly how to do really big thermal energy storage. That's why I'm really looking forward uh, to this presentation by Andreas. Andreas, the floor is yours. No, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, show a bit about our project, which is, as I said, is called Bubbling the Lake. So and it's a sour project, which is out of the box projects in this sense. So uh, let's say um, there's also the chance that maybe things do not work as expected. So this is uh, part of the game. Uh, what I would like to show you today is some um, about the general ideas and some experiments that we did. Of course, I cannot cover everything because we have only half an hour. So I will focus on two, three topics. Um, I will start with uh, see where I do click, where does it now? Yeah. With presenting the crew. So uh, we are, it's not me, only me, so we are several persons. What we see here is uh, the crew is working. So on the left side, this is me, Andreas Paul. Then we have in the middle is Alfred Bruno. He's also working at SPF in Lapisville. And we have Urs Meyer Egerto in the middle. He's from the company Luft und Laune, Luft und Laune. And on the right side, we have Rachel Ann Freeman. She's a student who did uh, work on this project. And what you see is that we were uh, doing some experiments outdoors. So just before Christmas, you remember it was very cold. And uh, you will see later why we were out there. But um, on the right side, maybe also the TRL level. So we see we are on a low level. I mean, we are not yet in, in six or seven or something like ready for a PNT project. So it's really trying whether it could work and what would be the, the problems, the caveats and the, the challenging challenges. So to start, I will not bore you too long with this uh, energy system thing, but uh, just to remind, I mean, we have something like 60 terawatt hours for uh, mobility today, 40 terawatt electricity and about 100 terawatt uh, heat. So this is uh, where we start today. And I think uh, if we start electrifying thing or to decarbonize uh, for 2050, so we will have to first, let's say, replace nuclear power. So it means that we have to add something like 10 terawatt hours renewable electricity. We will reduce mobility. I mean, not really in, in uh, kilometers or something per, per person but we will electrify mobility. So meaning that we use much less uh, energy and uh, will pollute much less uh, carbon dioxide, but we need another 20 terawatts, something like that in electricity. So this is also already quite optimistic from my understanding. Coming to heat, we have, um, I think we are not so bad in the heat. So we will uh, have better buildings. We will have better processes. And as we see in this year, also climate change will help maybe a bit. So we will reduce something like maybe 30 terawatt hours thermal until 2050. But we see still that there's a lot of uh, like energy to be replaced, especially in, in heat. Now, the good thing with the heat is that we don't have only one option. So we cannot only electrify heat to decarbonize the sector we can also use directly renewable heat. So this is a good advantage against, let's say, mobility, where we don't really have other options than electrifying. And this is why we should also use renewable heat. So if I think that, uh, I mean, today we are a bit more on track on of electrifying everything. And I have the feeling that this is, um, it's a nice, let's say it's nice to decarbonize, but we have the problem to, to get this electricity from somewhere. And I think we should more focus on renewable heat. Very shortly, but also seasonality. I mean, today we have quite a big seasonality from summer, winter on, on the demand side. This has to do with, uh, with the heating needs. I mean, we need space heating. 
And of course, the seasonality in supply side, which is the solar energy that is uh, better in summer than in winter. My feeling is that this will, uh, let's say, level out a bit. So we will have less seasonality on, on the demand side because uh, buildings are better and uh, climate change, whatever. But the seasonality on the supply side will not change. So the sun will still shine in summer and not in winter. So one good thing now is to use storage, of course, and to heat, to store heat from summer to winter. So very short summarized, I think we have to continue optimizing building and processes. We should use electricity first to replace nuclear and to electrify mobility. Of course, PV on every roof, this is very clear. But I think we also have to promote better that the expected power shortage or the Strommangellage is mainly also a heat shortage, is a heat mangellage, not only Strommangellage. So if we use renewable heat, then I think we have to focus more on burning biomass in winter, not in summer. A question mark on waste heat. I think we will reduce waste heat in the future because uh, plastic will be banned and Biomass will not be fired up anymore. Geothermal heat is also a bit the question mark, so we don't really know how it, uh, how it will work. Environmental heat, which is very popular now, is very much linked to the use of electricity. That's why I also put the question mark there. And I really think that seasonal heat storage is one of the very good things to, to reduce the, electric, uh, the, the need of electricity in winter and uh, to, to, let's say, support decarbonization of 2050. So that's so much for this, but this is the motivation. So we know that thermal storage works quite nice in buildings, for example, we know all the Yeni houses. So one of the best examples, this just works and is a good thing. Then we have these freestanding storages for district heating. Not so many in Switzerland, but uh, there is some, let's say, companies doing they mainly this as a business. Not in Switzerland again, but in other countries. But we know this works, so this is something like 60 meter high storage close to Ibach in Brunnen. If you go to Ticino next time, you will see it from the train, of course. And uh, in, not in Switzerland, but in countries like Denmark, we have these big, big pit storages like. Uh, I don't know how to call this community Wochens or something with 7,000 people. So they have installed one term storage pit with 200,000 cubic meters. So um, this seems to work and it works. Now in Switzerland, of course, we have the problem with space. So, uh, I mean, the idea is now to put these big storages not on land because land is quite expensive, especially if you live in Zurich or close to Zurich or in other big cities, and to put these storages in the lake. Because there is um, like enough space and lakes are not so used at the moment. So the idea is to do something like a jellyfish mainly. So have a, a skin which is very flexible, heat up the inside, leave the outside cold, and the uh, pressure inside is pressure outside. So the, the whole skin can be quite soft and uh, does not need how can I say rigid or, or big uh, construction work? So this is the idea behind that. And we wanted to investigate this in this project. So mainly to put something like a bubble in the lake, whether this is a ball or a cylinder is um, behind. It will go to a cylinder most probably, but uh, we will see. So talking about the size again, maybe if you look at the storage of, of maybe 100 meters, it is not so big. I mean, I can put the laser pointer here. So we see here, this would be the size of a 100 meter storage with 400,000 cubic meters. So this is already double of what is uh, found in, um, in Denmark. I mean, if you think bigger than something like 500 meters, which is really big, so we could uh, host something like 20 million cubic meters. So it's not so big and we can really host quite big volumes there. Now, as I'm from Rapperswil, so we put the same uh, 100 meter storage close to Rapperswil, which is here. Rapperswil is a bit bigger than the community in, in Denmark. So, but with such a storage, I think even the, the heat 
demand of wrappers will could be covered for the winter. So that looks um, not so frightening from my understanding. Now, when we uh, started the project, uh, we did not uh, really, I mean, we, we did some investigation on, on Google and uh, did not find too much. When we started the project, we found that already in the 1970s and 1980s, there was some smaller projects on this. There was even one of the first IEA tasks was including lake storages. But actually there was no result was found on this and no, no uh, outcome. So I don't really know whether these projects were started or were just planned or we didn't find anything, any results on this. But the idea is, to be very honest, not uh, sensational news. So people have thought about this sometime before. We look at the potential in Switzerland. Um, we see that there's uh, many, many, let's say, communities are very close to lakes. So this is in something like walking distance or something like 70 out of the 160 biggest cities or communities in Switzerland are very close to standing waters. So meaning that they could be potentially hosting such uh, bubbles. Um, what we also see is that uh, if we think that something like 10 or 20 kilometers away from a lake is also acceptable, then maybe 50% of the people in Switzerland are living very close to a lake. Actually in the projects in 1970, so the people thought that 100 kilometers between you storage is, ex is acceptable. I think this is a bit too optimistic to be very honest, but um, okay. So there's a lot of potential in Switzerland. And if you look at also at district heating systems, so we see that there's a, already a lot of district heatings in, in we have these in, in Switzerland, mostly fired by biomass. And uh, of course, this could be replaced or let's say partly replaced by storages so that we can use biomass for only for winter or for other purposes like construction uh, purposes, whatever. But I think the potential is really there. Now coming to the project, more to the technical side, we found that there is something like two basic concepts. So one is called the surface build. So this is uh, the bubble is swimming on the surface. This is, uh, has some advantages, of course. So the setup will be much simpler. It would be easy accessible for operation and maintenance and for sure what the The challenges would be more that we have uh, like environmental impact. So we have UV, other impacts, rain, wind, storm, snow, whatever. So everything is exposed. And of course, it would spoil somehow the landscape. It's not very nice to have such a bubble in the lake, let's say a visible. And uh, there's some safety issues, of course, and it would, uh, lake traffic ships would not like to have to have uh, storages in the lake like this. The other, the other option is to submerge the bills, which is of course uh, like um, the luxury version. So it would be invisible. No surface is used, so it would be very stable. The conditions are much easier. I mean, if you look at uh, like films in movies in, in the TV when they film fishes or something, so usually the water is quite calm if you go down a few meters, even if there's storms on the surface. So this would help if it could be submerged. But the problem is, of course, it would be much more difficult for accessibility and operation. And one of the big problems would be buoyancy. So we see that this um, could be the main challenging challenge is to control this buoyancy. Of course, there's uh, many, many research topics if you think about these bubbles. So I, I don't list everything, or I will not treat everything. So for sure, statics and buoyancy is, as mentioned, one of the big things. And materials, mooring, how to fix the thing is a, is a big challenge. Thermal insulation is one of the challenges that I will talk about. There's a lot of like uh, other topics like financial problems, legal, environmental, operational questions. I will not talk about this because we don't have time for this. 
uh, being an experimental physicist, I wanted to do also experiments. And so that's why we built like a very small bubble to do some experiments. So this is uh, built by the company Luft und Laune by Urs Egerto. So the, uh, we, we have a good collaboration with, with this company. The bubble is something like 2000 liters big, which is not very big if you look at this like this. But if you have if you have to handle it in the water, it's still quite substantial. It's two tons of water, and it's not so easy. So the height is two meters, radius 0.6 meters. So this is where we start and where we do experiments. So we were happy, so we were allowed to go in a swimming path of the city of Zurich. So this is close to Frankenthal, close to ETH, by the way. Very nice swimming area. So go there if you have in summer, basically. We had to go there in winter because in winter they lay, leave the water inside and we could, we were allowed to do some experiments there. So we brought the bubble in the, in the water. We organized some electric heater to do some experiments and to see how this is behaving underwater. Our first topic is statics and buoyancy. So of course, let's say if you put the bubble in the lake or let's say in the water and you and it's cold, so it will stay easily on the water. There is no problem. So it's just separating part of the water by your skin. Things are getting a bit different if you heat it up. So of course, this means that we have been used uplifting forces by uh, buoyancy, meaning that the bills want to, to raise and it will go to the surface. So you cannot avoid this. And the question is how can this be, can this be avoided or not? So doing some simple calculations and assuming like a more or less stiff uh, cylinder, it would mean that a 20 meter high storage would come out of the water by about uh, 80 centimeters or maybe one meter if heated up to 100 degrees. Of course, this would induce a lot of uh, forces on the on the bubble, and it would not be very nice. So we would prefer to hide the thing on the water. Using anchors is uh, is an option, of course. But if you think about the bubble of I don't know uh, maybe 100 meters size, then you need really a lot of anchors, and this would be very difficult to still have only a thin skin made of kind of plastics or something does not seem to be very feasible. So what we found or what we investigated then is to use uh, not only water, but to use saline water. And due to the different density of saline water, it would be possible to hide even a very hot bubble underwater just by adding, I mean, by using saline water. So this is a calculation, something like five to 6% would be enough to really hide the bubble, even if boiling. Of course, this is a, a bit unpleasant to use saline water in a, in a lake, but even from an environmental point of view, it would not be so critical, even if it bursts. So, but uh, we don't discuss this now. Um, looking at the Mediterranean Sea, this is something like 3.8 to 4%. So this means we have to be a bit higher than Mediterranean Sea to really make sure that the bubble is always underwater. Of course, we did uh, experiments also on this. So we heat it up to something like 30 degrees. So we did not manage much more because uh, we had no insulation at that time. So we heat it up, the bubble was on the surface. We added some uh, some normal salt, natrium chloride. And of course, the, bu the bubble is sinking then, even if it's uh, at temperature compared to the, to the surrounding water. So this works. But um, unfortunately, what uh, we also learned in this experiment is that um, the center of gravity is quite uh, essential. So if the, if the bubble is cooling down again, so the whole thing will fall on the side because the center of gravity is, uh, is lower if it's not vertical, but horizontal. And one of the problems that we, we found is so is that um, 
it's not possible to find the concentration where the bubble stays somewhere in, in, in equilibrium. So either it's sinking or it's raising. And uh, again, let's say if you heat it up again, then it would uh, not stay vertical. It would go on the surface and then it would tilt again. So this is one of the, of the main caveats or let's say problems that we found is that, um, that it, it's very difficult to control this buoyancy. So even if you use saline water, you cannot adjust the salinity, the salinity of the, of the bubble. I mean, that there's no simple mean to add or remove salt from the water. So, and this would be required because the temperature of the bubble is changing over time. So what we also learned is that the bubble is not behaving like a cylinder, like a fixed cylinder. So it would uh, flatten down, flatten, let's say on the surface, that will not go above the surface, it will just flatten out, especially because we have uh, like a flexible skin. So what we learned here is basically, in principle, it could be hidden underwater by using saline water that works and it's a, uh, it would not induce big forces on the skin, so that makes sense. But the problem is that uh, the, the, the temperature is changing over the season and this would re induce raising and descending forces that cannot be easily controlled. And actually, this is the same problem that has every submarine or every balloon. So there is not a stable, stable position in buoyancy. So you have to control either by using ballast propellers, jets, compressed air, whatever, you cannot have fixed uh, position, it's not possible. Oh, I see um, I'm already a bit late, so I will also speak about thermal insulation. So what is very important to understand is that the small bubble will not work. So if you want to make bubbles, we have to make very big bubbles to reduce the thermal losses. So here we did some calculation with different sizes and you see the bigger, the better, which is very clear. But I mean, if you go to really big surf bubbles, uh, let's say the um, losses are really decreasing. In a thermal insulation materials, we, know, we see that there's a relation between thermal conductivity and density. So these are not independent figures. And of course, to reduce the buoyancy problems, we have to find something that is uh, in the range of about 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter density. And if you look a bit closer, I mean, also, of course, thermal conductivity should be nice. It should be flexible. It should be durable. Insulation should be ecological, let's say, okay. It should be heat resistant and it should not be too expensive. So there's a lot of materials which uh, we investigated, but Basically, there's always something that is not very nice or not really what you would like to have it. And finally, we came to the conclusion that probably water could be a good material for insulation, which is maybe a bit surprising at first sight, because water has a lambda of something like 0.6 to 0.7, which is not, not really brilliant. I mean, if you look at this, there's a um, rock wool has something like 0.035, which is maybe 20 times less. To be honest, the uh, thermal losses are usually even higher if you would use water as insulation because we have a lot of convective effects. So meaning that it's even worse than what we see here. So the idea now is to immobilize the water. So to avoid that we have convective effects and to increase the, th the thickness of the insulation by something like a factor of 20, meaning that if we use something like two meters of immobilized water it would represent about the same insulation as 10 centimeters of rock wool. So this is a bit strange, but if you think about the bubble of 20 meters diameter, then it's fine to add two meters of insulation. So we did some experiments with the conventional insulation foam and we're hoping that this is absorbing a lot of water and it's like that, that we could consider that, that as like immobilized water. We did some experiments again in the swimming bath and let's be honest again, this did not work. So the thing did not soak up enough water so it was not sinking anymore and it was just not possible to really 
uh, like uh, fill this foam with water. So this was a missed success, did not work. Then thought about other materials and came to the to this material, which is uh, super absorbent polymers (SAP). These materials is like uh, is sodium poly polyacrylate. This is used in nappies, in sanitary products. It's used in food cooling, in cable industry, in many many sectors. And the nice thing is that it's something like a white powder. You add some water. And it will soak up something like 200 to 1000 times the volume of the powder. So, and this is getting something like a jelly. It's not uh, stiff, it's, it's still um, like uh, flexible. It's very pressure resistant. It's reversible, so you can dry it out again. It's temperature, temperature resistant. And it's rather low cost because it's used in so many applications in, in, in different uh, industries. It is not toxic. I mean, if you use it as in nappies and in uh, like food industry and, and medical applications, it cannot be too dangerous. So what we did is we made something like a simulator to test different types of insulation materials. So we put, uh, we made a pot of something like 1000 liter on one side, uh, the bubble where we could heat up the water to whatever we like. We have the lake with controlled um, uh, lake temperature and in between we, we put these flexible insulations. What we used is currents to make sure that it's like simulating a lake. So it's not standing water, lakes are always moving. So we tested several materials like uh, this uh, foam that we have seen at the beginning. We tested also only water, nothing in between. And we had some kind of a polyurethane foam which also worked not so bad. Here is the, this SAP, the super absorbent. And if you look at the, the let's say that the thermal losses, we see that this works quite nice. So the, the blue line would be just water. So this is not very good insulation. But uh, if you use this super absorbent, we see that it's, let's say it, it has much better insulation properties. So this basically works. Now we wanted, of course, to do some experiments and we were looking for some SAP subs that are already available. So uh, not invent the wheel again. And we found that this is used in uh, ice packs for food transport. So you can buy this uh, sub in, in plastic foils and this is getting something like, uh, it looks a bit like ravioli. So you have this in a plastic foil, which is very thin. You put it in water, it will soak up the water and it will become something like this, on the right side. So meaning that it's soaking up the water and uh, becoming like uh, insulation layers. So the idea is now to put these layers around the bubble and see what is the effect on it. You see here. This is where uh, our student Rachel made her work. And uh, so we did the same. So we used the same bubble again, but we put something like, I think, seven or nine layers of these uh, insulation ice packs around the, the bubble. So at the beginning, this was um, like one layer, put it in the water and you see it's soaking up with time water and we have something like an insulation around the, the bubble. This uh, works partly, let's say. So we have to be honest, there was too much floating water in between. So we would have to increase, so let's say improve the, the design a bit. But what we also learned just before Christmas is that uh, there's a big impact of snow and rain. So if it starts to rain, you see that uh, the heating up phase is really interrupted. And this has just to do because we have cold ingress of water in the insulation here and in the bubble. So this has to be, so we would have to make good cover to make sure that it's not exposed too much to wind and weather and rain and snow. So I think um, try to finish now. So, um, yeah, I mean, what you have seen now, so we have identified a lot of challenges and doing these experiments is, is very valuable. 
So just doing a literature study would not have helped us a lot. So we found a lot of problems and uh, challenges and caveats. But basically, I really think it, all the problems can be solved somehow. So there's no real killer argument so far. It seems to be feasible. I mean, there's some challenges and the thing must be big. The moment you are doing still some expert interviews with uh, people from other industries like materials. For example, I, I planned some interviews with people from um, aquaculture, like fishing, uh, fishing um, pots. So they know very much about how to, to do the mooring or the anchoring of such big devices in the lake or in, in, uh, in the sea even. So we will have interviews with people from pit storages, from material science. So this is ongoing now. For sure, there is uh, some technologies, technologies available from other industries that can be adopted. So not everything has to be reinvented again. As I said, there's technologies from aquaculture, from pit storage, chemical industry. But there's also some new challenges where I think there is nothing available at the moment. So for example, one big question would be how to produce such a big bubble on the lake. So it cannot be produced in a factory and brought as, a, as one piece to the lake and be installed. Maybe even bigger challenge is how to get the thing out again if it's installed and should be removed again. So there, I think we have to develop some new technologies that are not yet available or cannot be adopted from other industries. And of course, there's some uh, operational technologies or let's say processes that have to be developed, like how to charge and discharge the thing, so I think we will have to, to develop some, some things to, to manage inner sec, like boy, uh, stratification, because usually the, the thing would not be stiff, so it would be always moved by the surrounding currents. So stratification is, uh, will always be destroyed if we do not take any measures. And of course, buoyancy control is a big thing. What we learned also is that I mean, we can do some experiments, but uh, let's say the big size of the thing is like a relevant part of the concept. So we cannot do all the tests on these small devices and small scale samples. So if you want to really continue with this work, you would have to go for a functional sample that should be somewhere in the range of 100 cubic, I think, cubic meters. And the reasonable size for a real builds would always be something between five to, and let's say at least 5,000 cubic meters. I think below it does not make sense. And we really, I mean, it does not make sense to make small builds, it will always be big. So if, let's say, if you think, or if we come to the, or let's say if there's the opportunity to continue with this work, then we would need a new or a bigger project. So it cannot be done with what we have now. Of course, we need a bigger consortium with more participants from other industries, and we need a district heating network where we can, say, connect the thing to it. My feeling is at the moment that the next version would be like with uh, with vertical segmentation to uh, manage stratification. We cannot have just a big chamber; it must be segmented. We would have something like radially segmented. Uh, superabsorbent insulation compartments. At the bottom, we would also have something like these superabsorbent uh, containers. On top, we can use conventional covers from uh, pit storages. The whole thing would be surface floating, I think. The challenges to, to have it really hidden underwater are very big. And I would not go in the first try to, to really hide the bubble in the lake. So to have it floating on the surface. We need some steel ropes on the whole thing to, to add some stability to the body. And of course, for mooring. So this is, um, I think there's no way out of this. And I think the minimum diameter should be something like 20 meters and the insulation must be something like two meters. So it would be a very big thing, which cannot be done in, uh, in the sour, in the frame of the sour project. We just don't have the money and the capacity and the time is also not left anymore. So I hope you enjoyed. So it was like just pointing out two, three 
thoughts or let's say experiments that we did, we put, let's say, the results on, on our web page. So we have a small web page, builds.tech. Uh, you can see more there. And um, so I hope that some point we will see a bubble somewhere in a lake. Maybe it will look like this. And I say thank you for listening. And if you have questions or if you have if you if you have input, I mean I'm happy about every input, of course. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Uh, really fascinating to see.